Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. This is going to be a change of pace video for the channel, so brace yourselves. The Atheist Society of Calgary asked me to speak at their local Darwin Day event this year. If you follow me on Twitter or Facebook, you may have seen me plugging the event, and a number of people asked me to record it and post it here. So, you asked for it. This was my first public speaking event since becoming an atheist, and I couldn't have asked for a better audience. The fact that alcohol was served probably helped. Well, thank you so much for coming out to hear me discuss a little bit about attacking the attacks on Darwin. Uh, as Ellen mentioned, I'm a YouTuber, so when I normally talk about science, this is the first time I've talked about science and I got to be in public. Normally I'm doing that in front of a video camera where I can edit things, I can chop things up, and if I you know, say something wrong, I can go back and fix it. I do not have that chance tonight. Some of you smarter people than me can maybe cough when I'm saying something wrong or whatever. <laughs> but that's not the worst part for me. The worst part for me, I realized, was that normally when I make my videos, I'm not wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, so I checked with Callan, I checked the rules at the bar here. Apparently it's very important that we all wear pants throughout. <laughs> so I will attempt to keep it short so we can all get back to our favorite non-pants activities. Whatever those may be when I'm done. So, happy Darwin Day. Some of you may know, Charles Darwin was born on February 12th, 1809. So that's how we get Darwin Day. Some of you astute people may also realize that today is not February 12th. <laughs> today is February 22nd, so we are 10 days behind. I have no idea why that is, no one has played me. Um, the, uh, however, if it had been February 12th, I couldn't have been here. I hope that's not what caused this to be delayed, because, as we're going to explore a little bit, I want to first start out with who I am and why I am the least qualified person in this room to talk about Charles Darwin. <laughs> first of all, it's important to note that I am not a biologist. I took biology in high school, up to grade 12. Here's the extent of what I remember. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I don't know what those words mean. <laughs> I know that's the order and I know how to spell them. So I got an A in that class, but I don't remember anything. I am not a historian. I took social studies, but I didn't like it. I, the, for me, the, it was all about the future, all about computers, all about looking forward. I had no interest in looking backwards. Yet here I am, talking about Charles Darwin. So what have I studied? Well, here's an impressive list of credentials. I studied theology at uh, Canadian Bible College in Regina. <laughs> which is now uh, it's now Ambrose College here in Calgary. Some of you may have heard of it. So I studied that. Then I went to went back home to Saskatoon and studied commerce. So money, business, all that kind of stuff. And I studied computer science. So my degrees give me absolutely nothing to talk about Charles Darwin. And it gets worse. My life experiences don't tell me anything about Charles Darwin either. I am best known, outside of these circles, as someone who worked for George Lucas on the three Star Wars movies that you hate. <laughs> I know I'm at best to play Jar Jar, he's a great guy. And I almost worked on the Indiana Jones movie that you hate, but I got out just in time. And it gets even worse. Because up until a few years ago, I believed that this was a real photograph of a real thing that happened. <laughs> I was a young earth creationist up until just a few years ago. I actively campaigned against evolution. I thought that the world was created in, in about 6,000 years ago in six literal days. So for me, evolution was against everything that I stood for. And I was, a, I was in youth ministry for a long time and I taught hundreds of teenagers that this what Charles Darwin taught was all crap. However, we've already established I am a YouTuber. My channel is Paul Gia, for those of you looking at how to spell it. The one good thing about being on YouTube is the instant you get a YouTube channel, you are, in, you are given all knowledge about all things and about being correct about everything. <laughs> if you ask any YouTuber, they will tell you they know everything and that they are correct about everything. So that is one advantage I currently have. 
However, I have chosen to pick the few things that I am highly qualified in doing to speak to you about today. I was really good at attacking Charles Darwin, or so I thought. I was excellent at uninformed opinions, and I was really good at factually incorrect assertions. Those were my wheelhouse. So I'm going to share with you today some of the things that I used to say as a believer to attack Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution, and explain to you a little bit why those things I now know are false. But you'll hear all of these arguments today. I heard some of them this weekend. Let's start with the first one. Charles Darwin was a racist. I mean, come on. He lived in 1809 to 1882, so he had to be a little bit racist, right? I mean, if you think about even just our own grandparents um, and the way they would speak now, we would, they would all be considered a little bit racist in this room. Um, so go back 200 years beyond that, five more generations, great, 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 great grandfather. Probably some of the words that they would use are not appropriate. I remember my grandfather, uh, who was a dairy farmer, he used to hire, go out of his way to hire First Nations people as his hired hands. And he would so much as invite them to dinner. All of his hired hands ate with his children side by side. Uh, all, all kinds of First Nations people constantly there for dinner. However, as you can imagine, my grandfather did not call them First Nations people. He used words that if I were to say them now, you guys would escort me out. But he loved them. But if you want to look to see using bad words, you don't need to go very far. And Charles Darwin sure fit it in. We all know his main book as the origin of the species by means of natural selection. That's what it's called today. However, the first five editions of the book, up until the sixth edition, was called The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection and the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. That was the title of the book, it had the phrase favored races. What more evidence do you need, right? This dude's a racist. However, the origin of the species, for those of you who read it, you will realize and remember, the book doesn't talk about humans at all. The entire book is about animals and plants. There is one mention of men, one mention of human, humanity, and it's in the last chapter. And it's just a very brief mention uh, saying that he believes that probably the processes that created the animals probably applies to humans as well. So it's not like this book talks about human races at all. Uh, there wasn't a lot of definitive um, words for things like breed uh, or variation or species at the time. So he just used the word race interchangeably in this book. However, when I was a Christian, this was a be all and end all. However, smarter Christians understand that there are other books that we can pull from. When he wrote The Descent of Man, that's when Charles Darwin really stuck his foot in it. So there's quotes like this one. The Western nations of Europe, who now so immeasurably surpass their former savage progenitors and stand at the summit of civilization. So here we're looking at savage. So everyone came before the, the Europe. Yeah. Everyone came before Europe were savage and that Europe was the summit of civilization. Not a great line. Further, at some future period, not as distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. The break will then be rendered wider, for it will intervene between man and the more civilized state, as we may hope, than the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of, at present, between the Negro or Australian, and the gorilla. When he says Australian, he means Australian Aborigines. So that's pretty bad. Not good. Uh, these are words, that, reclamatory words, we wouldn't use now, let alone this whole idea that he's putting forth that uh, Caucasian seems to be better than, than Australian and gorilla more civilized. So we can go with that. However, if you've read this book, you'll also realize that what Charles Darwin talks about was not a ladder of being better, but he talked about a chronology. <coughs> Darwin believed that life began in Africa with darker skinned humans, which is generally what biologists believe today. Um, and that from there, uh, they went up into, into the Middle East, Europe, and spread across the world, and that the other races of men came chronologically later. Um, he didn't specifically mean better, but if you want to take these in, in the current context, they look bad. 
But just like my grandfather, it maybe it's, is a little bit, let's think about how he viewed these people as opposed to maybe some words that he used that we kind of cringe at. Charles Darwin was the grandson of two prominent abolitionists. If you don't know what an abolitionist is, they were people who fought against the slave trade in Europe. So his grandfathers were very active in the, in the slave trade. Erasmus Darwin on his father's side and Josiah Wedgwood on his mother's side. Um, fought against slavery and actually Europe solved their slavery problem before America did. So he was raised in a home with this as the lineage. Charles Darwin also joined what was called the Jamaican Summit, Jamaican Committee, pardon me. And in the Jamaican Committee, Charles Darwin spoke actively against the governor of Jamaica, who during a riot killed over 400 black men and women who were basically struggling to just exist. And 400 of them were killed and nothing was being done about it. So Charles Darwin and several other people uh, petitioned the legislature to say that these black men and women should be given all of the benefits of all other citizens of the Commonwealth, and they eventually uh, prevailed in this. So he managed to get this governor who killed these 400 men and women uh, to be prosecuted. And in The Voyage of the Beagle, which is uh, Charles Darwin's book that he wrote, which is basically his diary that he wrote for the, the senior shipwreck that he took, uh, when it came up to a section about where he encountered some slaves and some slave trade, this is what he wrote. It makes one's blood boil, yet heart tremble, to think that we Englishmen, with our American descendants, with their boastful cry of liberty, have been and are so guilty. So he very much lamented slavery and slave trade. And one can say, does it actually even matter? When it comes to his scientific theory, no, it doesn't. He could have been the most racist bastard ever to walk the face of the earth. And that would actually say nothing about his scientific theories. Um, in fact, uh, if you feel like, as homework, Google um, science that we learned from Nazi scientists. There's a lot of cures and a lot of things that came out of uh, Nazi research that we still use today, and we don't discard it because of the racist origins. So, in a way, it doesn't matter. Darwin wasn't a scientist. One sec. So the charge against him is that this man could not have invented a very good scientific theory that everyone accepts because he wasn't ever a scientist. In fact, his only degree that he ever earned was a Bachelor of Arts, generally in theology, because he was studying to be part of the parish, to be part of the ministry, to be a priest. And this is at uh, Christ Church College in Cambridge, where he studied and got his only degree that he has. And Christians like me would like to point out that when he went on to the Beagle as their naturalist, he couldn't even earn that job. His dad got him that job and paid his salary. He was not actually part of the crew because his father bought his way on board, and they basically let him come along and run his little experiments and whatever, as his dad giving him something to try and do. This man was not a scientist. But interestingly, the term scientist was coined in 1834. The Beagle sailed in 1831. He couldn't have been a scientist because that word didn't exist. <laughs> It was actually invented, yeah, in 1831 by William Wheel. I think that's how you pronounce the name. If not, sorry, William. I don't think he's alive anymore. Before that, scientists, or people who acted like scientists, were called naturalists. And it was actually a branch of philosophy, not any other branch of philosophy, which is actually why uh, scientists today get PhDs. They're actually philosophy degrees, which sounds a little bit weird. But natural science was a branch of philosophy. And Charles Darwin was definitely a naturalist. Christians like me tend to ignore the fact that Charles Darwin first went to medical school at the University of Edinburgh. He went there, and he dropped out, actually he failed out, because he was bored. He did not like lectures, he did not like whatever, he wanted to run his own experiments. He went around, did his own thing, uh, and eventually they kicked him out because he was just too much trouble. He's kind of like a Steve Jobs type in that way. He also got kicked out of college just for being a jerk. And his dad bailed him out and said, you have to do something with your life and put him into seminary. So it wasn't that Charles Darwin couldn't cut it. You know. um, also, the scientific method in the 1800s was not refined at all, but Charles Darwin was part of a crew that refined it. He was very paramount in um, doing controlled experiments where you controlled for only one variable. He 
he was one of the first to do very meticulous observations and, and readings um, and, rec and recording, and to be able to write down your experiments in such a way, having a methodology section that other people could replicate your work. Charles Darwin was credited with all of that. Charles Darwin was a renowned entomologist, which is the study of insects and bugs. This is actually Charles Darwin's personal field collection, which is still on display. Um, he did that all through college and all through high school, and that's part of what helped him get kicked out of medical school, was he was too many bugs. Um, now his work in entomology, nothing, he didn't come up with anything that we use today currently, but he was well known and uh, hung out with people of the day whose work we still study. But that said, Charles Darwin was a geologist, first and foremost. Uh, I've been told that even if Charles Darwin had never come up with the theory of natural selection or any of that kind of stuff, that geologists, maybe not us in this room, but geologists would know his name. He, the, the kind of, these are some of his maps that he drew. Uh, the kind of observations that he did are still used today in a lot of sections in a lot of areas of the world, and his work in coral reefs are still used today in terms of other form. He worked with his friend Charles Lyell, and at the time, the common view of geology was catastrophism. The world, most scientists felt, well, naturalists, felt that all the features of the world were created by floods and volcanoes and all that kind of thing, or maybe one big flood, depending on what you believe. Um, and that was the general view of the day, was catastrophism. Well, Darwin and Charles Lyell were among the first to try and look at things and say, you know what, even the geology is, is can be explained with predictable, slow processes that are still in effect today. Um, and so I'm told that his geology work is still above reproach and still is the bedrock of what is used now. But does it matter? Would it matter at all if Charles Darwin was not a scientist? If he'd never been trained, if he had never learned anything from any other teacher, what was that? Would, we, would that affect the truth of, of natural selection and evolution? No, it wouldn't. Uh, it happens all the time that... Uh, People discover things that are not in an area they're not specifically trained for. Now, it's a little more rare now. We value education more than they did. But in a way, this claim actually would make zero difference at all. <laughs> Charles Darwin invented evolution because he was mad at God. Uh, invented, being the key word there. He invented it because he was mad at God. Now, Charles Darwin was a renowned family man. He had 10 children, two of whom uh, passed away as infants, unfortunately. Uh, this is his with his son William, and it's weird that his son William was wearing a dress, but that's all the pictures and all wearing dresses. Um, but of his ten children, it's said that his favorite was Anne. Anne with an E. And Anne inherited her father's stomach illness. Charles Darwin and Anne both had an illness that was never properly diagnosed, no one ever figured out what it was, but it was painful and wrenching to the point of you know, vomiting and not being able to do anything, not being out of bed. And so at, at nine, Anne started developing the symptoms very strongly. And for the last half a year or so of her life, she was in and out of comas, bedridden, and Charles spent that entire time at her side. And she passed away at the age of 10. And this was a huge blow in Charles Darwin's life. Uh, it is well documented that this was a shake-up for him. Um, however, that happened in 1851, and if you're following the chronology, that is 20 years after the Beagle sailed in 1831. So, and it is actually 14 years after he wrote in his famous red notebook, where he wrote down his, all of his theory of natural selection or sort of speciation. Now, he held that for many years. He didn't publish it for a long time, but all the basics of that book was in this red diary, 14 years before his daughter died, and obviously that's at least four years before she was even conceived. So the idea that Charles invented this thing to get revenge on God uh, is a little bit, the, the timing's a little off. And again, does it matter? Would it really matter if this whole thing was just a shaking your fist at this God that you, that you hate now? No, it wouldn't affect anything about this theory. The evolution of the eye is absurd. I've used this one. Because Charles Darwin says so. If you've ever heard of quote mining, that's what we're talking about here. So here's a quote from The Origin of Species that you will find in Christian literature all around the world very frequently, very often. And this is what Charles Darwin said. To suppose that the eye, with all its imitable contrivances for the adjusting of focus to different distances, 
for emitting different amounts of light and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. All right. So we have Charles Darwin telling us that the evolution of the eye is absurd. If you're a Christian, boom, right? We're done. But. But. They don't like to read the next paragraph. Exactly. Which I will skim for you. It's a little bit there. Um, when it was first said that the sun stood still and that the world turned round, the common sense of mankind declared the doctrine false. But the old saying, vox pupar... Vox populi, vox die, as every philosopher knows, cannot be trusted in science. Reason tells me that if numerous gradations from the simple and imperfect eye to a complex and perfect can be shown to exist, each grade being useful to its processor, as is certainly the case, if further the eye ever varies and variations can be inherited, as is likewise certainly the case, if such variations could be useful to the animal under changing conditions of life, then the difficulty of believing that a perfect and complex eye could be formed by natural selection, though insuperable by our imagination, should not be considered as subversive to the theory. So basically what he's saying is, this sounds really weird, but the facts say that it's true. So we like, they like to cut it off at that first part. And of course, we know that it's true. We have all of the animals, and Charles Darwin actually spends the whole rest of the chapter explaining the evolution of the eye. So this is a bad argument that I used to use. Transitional fossils. Darwin admits they're missing. This is the whole transitional fossils, missing link, that kind of thing. Here's a quote. I could have picked one of thousands. Unfortunately for this one, or fortunately, smartly, they don't directly quote Darwin on this. They like to paraphrase Darwin on this. So I picked one paraphrase, but there are hundreds of others from videos and, and books around. This one says, Darwin himself was well aware of the problems that the fossil record posed for his theory. Where were the multitudes of transitional forms connecting different groups, as predicted and expected by his theory? So Darwin, according to, the, according to creationists on this point, knows that there should be transitional fossils, but we don't have them. Now here's the quote that they are paraphrasing. Why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this, perhaps, is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. The explanation lies, as I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. So, Charles Darwin admits we don't have a lot of transitional species. But what he's saying is, we don't have a lot, because it's really hard to become a fossil. If you guys know anything about fossilization, you know that, first of all, the animal has to be buried very quickly. It has to be buried fast enough that other scavengers don't get to it, that it doesn't decay first, that the elements don't just scatter it. So it's got to be buried quickly. It has to be buried in, an, in the proper kind of minerals that can uh, permeate the, the bone. So basically what happens when the fossils are created, or the kind we see in museums um, for bones, is that minerals seep into the bone and eventually slowly over a long time replace the calcium and replace the minerals in the bone with whatever minerals are in the soil around it. So it has to be buried very quickly and it has to sit very still for a long, long, long time for us to get fossils. Um, current biologists estimate that fewer than 1% of the species that have lived on our planet have a representative fossil that we found so far. So where are these 99%? That's basically what everyone says is saying. And Darwin says, uh, unfortunately, that's a problem for geology, not a problem for biology. It doesn't mean it's not true. And I just wanted to show my favorite transitional form, which is tectonic. And the reason it's my favorite is because it was predicted. Um, scientists were looking at uh, fish in the water, and they were looking at amphibians on land, and when in the fossil record they started to see that the amphibians showing and so they actually estimated where approximately in the fossil record should we find something in between them. And not only that, they were also able to figure out where geographically they would expect to find such a creature. And that actually happened to be in the Arctic of Canada. Now, 
the crew that figured this out spent a good whole four years digging up there, and that was an arduous and very slow process. But after four years, they eventually found Tiktaalik, a fish with a lot of features of amphibians, and including walking fins that they, they determined were able to walk on land. So Tiktaalik is part of the predictive success of evolution, even if we don't have all of the forms in between. And lastly, Darwin's deathbed conversion. So, Charles Darwin died in April 19, 1882, and he is currently buried in Westminster Abbey, which pisses off people like I used to be. <laughs> he's buried in one of the world's most famous churches, and he subverts, of course, all the things. However, very shortly after he died in 1882, a series of sermons started popping up in South Wales that Charles Darwin not only recanted of evolution and he said, admitted that he made it up and that it was all fake, but that he converted to Christianity on his deathbed and was currently living in heaven. Well, so the sermons went. Uh, and this actually was first documented uh, by a divinity, divinity professor a few years later from Glasgow who, again, confirmed that he expected to see Charles Darwin in heaven because of his conversion. However, it took about 28 years later until this was really caught fire by this woman named Lady Hope. And she was an evangelist. That's a pretty great evangelist name, right? That's like, you can all see the Marvel superhero poster with Lady Hope coming in. <laughs> that actually wasn't her last name. She had to marry a, a certain Admiral James Hope to, to get that last name. And I kind of feel like maybe that was a professional thing that she did. But Lady Hope traveled around with her father and, uh, and was an evangelist in, in the early 1900s. And she happened to be in Massachusetts in 1915. And she was telling the congregation about how she personally was with Charles Darwin when this all happened. She was with him when he decided to um, recant of evolution and convert to Christianity. Now there happened to be, in the audience that day, an editor for the Watchman Examiner, a National Baptist paper that was around that day. And this editor approached uh, Lady Hope and asked her to write it out. So in August of that year, they actually published an article detailing her full claim of what happened. So this is the sort of the first written thing. So there's several things to note in her, her account. Uh, one was that she visited him in August, um, sorry, in autumn. Uh, and that at that time, Charles was already uh, bedridden by her note, and that he couldn't leave his bed at the time. Um, one of the things that she said was that he was studying his Bible, and that that was what he always spent his time doing at the time, that he was constantly reading his Bible. He admitted that his, his ideas about science were all just foolish young dreams, and that he had no substantive uh, way to back them up. And finally, that he asked her, last lady, hope to come back to, so that she can give a service to all of his servants. And he wanted all of his servants to gather in their summer home, and so that she could give a lecture and hopefully convert as many of his servants as possible. Now, unfortunately, there were some factual problems with these things. The first is that uh, Lady Hope wasn't actually there in August, at, in autumn at the time, in the country, where she said that she was. So the only connection time she could have even had with Charles Darwin was seven months before he died. And he was not yet bedridden at that point. He was only bedridden at the very end. So a good seven months before definitely didn't happen that way. And uh, their summer house, which apparently he asked to have them come and join, uh, was a very tiny little, basically a change room shack. Uh, there's no way that the 30 servants could have possibly had a servant there. So that definitely was a request that wouldn't have made sense. But despite that, uh, more convincing against this was the family denials. This is Francis Darwin, one of his sons. Francis immediately starting, started writing letters to all of the newspapers of the day, basically saying that if my dad had converted, someone in the family would have known about it. No one in the family knows about this, so as far as they were concerned, it didn't happen. And actually, uh, his daughter Henrietta, which I don't have a picture of Henrietta, um, Henrietta actually went on to write to the newspapers basically saying that she had been by her father's side for the last six months and had never met Lady Hope, had never seen her on the grounds, 
you know, this person, if, if she had visited her father, she certainly would know about it. But probably most convincingly was Emma Darwin, uh, Charles Darwin's wife. Now, I, I haven't really talked about her much. Emma was a Christian her entire life. The fact that Charles came up with this theory bothered her greatly. And it's actually one of the main reasons why he didn't publish his work sooner than he did. He went on, he waited a full 14 years from coming up with the theory to publish, mainly because his wife knew what a devastation this would be to their religious uh, family, friends, all that kind of stuff. Um, Emma wanted nothing more than for Charles to recant and to become a Christian. So she is on record that she wanted nothing more, but she, again, agrees that this did not happen. But would it matter, really, if Charles Darwin again on his deathbed decided that I made this all up and it's all false and I believe in Jesus now and you'll know, see you in heaven. Um, that doesn't invalidate any of his theories, obviously. So why these are all uh, attacks? Uh, as you can see, they, they made a lot of sense to me at the time. You're going to hear them a lot if you ever talk to creationists about evolution. But really, none of them hold that much water. And, because I lived my whole life listening to someone like me tell them things that are supposedly true, I lived my whole life based on authority, and I accepted these attacks on Charles Darwin based on the authority of the person who was speaking. So I urge you today, if anything caught your ear, if anything seems like a good argument to you, if, anyone, if anything seems wrong, if anything seems weird, please go check it out for yourself. Please do not accept what I'm telling you on, a, on my authority, because I have... As we established, I have not. <laughs> Thank you. So my dad, yay. Yeah. Thank you. That was followed by some Q&A time, but it was a mix of local happenings, some of my story that's already been available on video here, and information you're probably better off asking Google. Thanks again to all the friends, strangers, fans, and even some patrons who showed up. And once again, for the Atheist Society of Calgary for hosting such a great event. Next time, we're back to science videos. Thanks for watching, everyone. Until next time, later.